Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Shepard, and I'm happy to welcome you to my presentation on due process and the Watergate trials, did politics trump the rule of law? I believe it's the most timely topic on this 40th anniversary of the Watergate break-in. As you know, may know from prior appearances, I served on President Nixon's White House staff for five years, first as a White House fellow and then as associate director of the Domestic Council. I also acted as principal deputy to J. Fred Bizart, President Nixon's Watergate defense counsel. So I also have had some firsthand experience with Watergate itself. As you may have seen on TV, it all ended rather badly, with President Nixon being the only president to resign from office and to have his top aides convicted on all counts in the Watergate cover-up trial. As you shall see, I hold rather strong opinions about some of those events and believe there was a huge miscarriage of justice. So I should note that I speak only for myself today, and my appearance here is not an endorsement by the Richard Nixon Foundation or by the National Archives that operates the Nixon Library. And in fact, my subject today is not Watergate itself or President Nixon. Whatever you may think of our 37th president or his involvement in or handling of Watergate, I ask you to put those feelings aside and consider, as objectively and dispassionately as possible, a separate question. I'm going to raise the disturbing possibility that the political hysteria that surrounded the unfolding of the Watergate scandal, whatever the real nature of the facts or guilt or innocence of the accused, resulted in the denial of the most basic rights for the Watergate defendants, the right to a fair trial. Because of the sensitivity of the subject matter, even after 40 years, I hope you will forgive me if I read much of what I have to say. This is partially because today's presentation is a somewhat abbreviated summary of a law review article that's going to be published this spring, which will contain appropriate references and footnotes that are designed to assist in further research and review of the issues I'm about to raise. As we begin, I think it's important to put Watergate into context. What we call the unrest of the 1960s was really a two-decade period of intense political, cultural, and social upheaval when no president was able to complete two terms of office. President Kennedy was assassinated. Presidents Johnson and Nixon were essentially driven from office. President Ford was not elected at all. And President Carter was resoundingly defeated in his bid for re-election. One reason, of course, was the Vietnam War. The widespread opposition to that war made it easily the most unpopular war in modern American history. The growth of troops in Vietnam peaked at 537,000 U.S. soldiers when President Nixon took office, a number that had declined to less than 200 when he left. There were political assassinations, bloody riots in at least 19 cities, and great universities shut down by violent student protests as the nation itself swirled toward anarchy. The government's response, as you might imagine, was to try to suppress the dissent. It led to invasions of privacy, to abuses of power, all fully documented in the 1975-76 hearings before the Senate Select Committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities. There's no question but that Richard Nixon had to resign because of the Watergate scandal. But what troubles me is that many commentators would have you believe that this was all accomplished in conformance with our Constitution. There's even a quote at the end of the Watergate exhibit next door to the effect that what happened was the Constitution worked. And I recognize that this assurance has become conventional wisdom today. Well, that's one of the things I'd like to review with you and talk about in today's presentation. First, let me remind us of the key Watergate dates. And they're shown here on the, on the slide. The key presentation of the campaign intelligence plan occurred in two meetings on January 27th and February 4th, 1972, in Attorney General Mitchell's office. The actual break-ins occurred on May 28th and June 17th. The June 17th is the one that ended in the arrests. The, the folks were indicted on September 15th, 1972, and convicted in a trial, the first trial, the Watergate break-in trial, that ended on January 30th, 1973. The Senate, the Senate Watergate Committee, the Irvin Committee, was created shortly thereafter on February 7th. The cover-up collapsed in May 
The special prosecutor was appointed. The cover-up collapsed in March. The special prosecutor was appointed in May. President Nixon resigned a little over a year later on August 9, 1974. And the scandal concluded with a conviction of President Nixon's top aides in the cover-up trial that ended on January 1, 1975. Now, I did a presentation here in this theater in May of, 19, of uh, 2010 entitled Five Watergate Conspiracies. That raised lingering questions about the origin and purpose of the Watergate break-in itself, a debate that continues to this very day. But that's not my presentation today. Today, I'm going to focus only on the last event, the conviction of President's top aides in the Watergate cover-up trial. Here are the six people we're going to be talking about today. Across the bottom line are the three people who actually committed the crimes, the operational figures of the break-in and or the cover-up. Gordon Liddy, who masterminded the break-in. Jeb Magruder, his boss at the Committee to Re-elect the President, popularly known as Creep. And John Dean, the President's counsel, who ran the cover-up itself. Across the top line are the ones who were convicted of orchestrating the cover-up. John Mitchell, the former Attorney General, who then headed Creep. Bob Haldeman, the President's Chief of Staff and John Ehrlichman, the assistant to the president for domestic affairs. The issue all along, at least for me, was whether this top line, these folks along the top, in fact knowingly directed the activities of those people shown along the bottom line. But since the scandal ended with convictions on all counts of these three men, John Mitchell, Bob Haldeman, and John Ehrlichman, one could well ask why any uncertainty would remain. Convicted, yes. But the issue I'll raise today is whether those convictions were obtained in conformance with the Fifth Amendment's guarantee that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or, or freedom, or, or life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Or whether those convictions were the result of what amounted to political show trials, more like those in some to totalitarian regime, designed to preclude any new or difficult questions about what the American public had been told about who was responsible for the Watergate scandal. There's no question in my mind but that these men did not receive a fair trial. What I'm going to show you today is why I hold that belief. No matter how reviled you are, and the Watergate defendants were certainly among the most reviled and hated in modern American history, when you're brought into a court of law, you should at least have the benefit of certain constitutional guarantees, including the presumption of innocence and the right to due process of law. The term due process is not defined in the Bill of Rights. It wasn't drafted by lawyers. It was drafted by a few of our founding fathers who had experienced government uh, oppression firsthand. In its broadest sense, however, due process is not a complicated concept. And it certainly involves certain things. A trial judge who is both fair and impartial. A jury of your peers drawn from a, pro a pool that is both untainted and unbiased. A nonpartisan prosecutor bound by consistently applied rules of conduct and the right to an appeal to a court of review that is itself both fair and impartial. Today's presentation will explore each of these areas, but let us begin with the judge. John Sereca, the chief judge of the D.C. federal courts, who appointed himself to preside over both Watergate trials. Long before Watergate, Judge Sereca had a reputation within the D.C. bar as being both scrappy and irascible. His nickname, Maximum John, came from his tendency to sentence defendants to the maximum prison terms allowable by law. Seniority had earned him the position of chief judge, but that power wasn't necessarily based on his judicial temperament or his acumen. Indeed, Judge Sirica was the single most reversed judge in the D.C. courts, mainly for his lack of attention to defendants' rights during trial. I suggest to you this afternoon that Judge Sirica was neither fair nor impartial. In fact, his trial conduct at the time was extraordinarily controversial. Since then, my research has uncovered at least four instances of his having had private meetings with prominent individuals, 
each having direct interest in the outcome of his Watergate trials that have come to light since those trials occurred. In legal lingo, such meetings are known as ex parte meetings because the defendant's counsel is not present to challenge statements being made or to defend their client's interests. Let us start with Edward Bennett Williams. The biography of Edward Bennett Williams describes how Williams, who was counsel to the Washington Post and counsel to the Democratic National Committee and godfather of John Sirica's son, used his influence with a judge to quietly resolve the problems that arose when Woodward and Bernstein attempted to interview grand jurors in their homes. The media coverage of the Watergate trials assumed and asserted that since Judge Sirica had been appointed by President Eisenhower, he would be inclined to support President Nixon. It wasn't reported, because it wasn't known, that the hugely influential Edward Bennett Williams had ex parte meetings with the judge. Mr. Williams, who was probably the most renowned trial lawyer on the East Coast, as well as Washington's one of, one of Washington's preeminent power brokers, had been John Sirica's mentor throughout his career. Needless to say, Mr. Williams was also a powerful and partisan Democrat. The issue about interviewing grand jurors was all handled very amicably and informally, since these two were such good friends. But if you read Williams' biography, and it's shown here on the screen, the, the man to see, you also will find out that the original draft of Woodward and Bernstein's own book suggested that their initiative to interview grand jurors had been approved in advance because Williams was so confident he could handle any adverse fallout. Let me give you three more examples. First, at the top, Clark Molinoff. In his book, Game Plan for Disaster, he talks about his successful efforts to convince Judge Sirica to use his judicial powers to investigate the origins of the Watergate break-in. Clark Molinoff was a highly influential and Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter for the Des Moines Register. In 1969, he had joined the new Nixon administration to serve as special counsel to the president. But it didn't work out, and after a year, Molinoff had been squeezed out of the White House and had returned to journalism. For whatever reason, pure conviction, or to justify himself to his once and future journalistic colleagues, he turned on President Nixon. And he also carried a considerable grudge against Haldeman and Ehrlichman because they were the ones that squeezed him out. Molinoff writes in his book how he felt that Judge Sirica was lonely and in need of encouragement in the period leading up to the first Watergate trial and about his series of long conversations with the judge about the importance of the, of the triumph of right over wrong. Molinoff then wrote widely circulated columns praising Judge Sirica in advance of the break-in trial for his expected vigorous pursuit of the truth. If you ever wonder who convinced Judge Sirica to act more as an investigative magistrate than as a trier of fact, this whole series of ex parte meetings with Clark Molinoff might be a good place to start. Now, Molinoff's columns praising Judge Sirica certainly had their intended effect. In the midst of the break-in trial, Time Magazine named Judge Sirica its Man of the Year, certainly a singular honor for a district court judge, but one that no doubt encouraged him to even greater efforts to uncover the truth behind the Watergate break-in. And now, uh, uh, Earl Silver, that's the middle section here. Judge Sirica, in his own book, describes how he instructed prosecutor Earl Silbert on how he thought the government should conduct its trial. Earl Silbert was the lead prosecutor in the break-in trial. Judge Sirica's book reveals how he met privately with Silbert to advise him on how he, Sirica, thought Silbert should conduct the prosecution. This was not a casual conversation. Sirica urged Silbert to read how Sirica had handled a similar cover-up situation during a congressional investigation, thrusting the volume of those hearings into Silbert's hands with a recommendation that he study Sirica's actions with great care. Earlier drafts of Judge Sirica's book, available at the Library of Congress, go into even greater detail of how proud Sirica was of his actions during those congressional investigations and how significant those lessons were to him 
in the decisions he made while presiding over the first Watergate trial. Finally, we're going to talk about Sam Dash at the bottom of this slide. Sam Dash was chief counsel of the Senate Watergate Committee, and he writes in his book of his successful effort to convince Sirica to condition reductions in stiff prison sentences on cooperation with his committee's investigation. Now, he was meeting with Judge Sirica following the break-in trial, but before the defendants were sentenced. And he advocated an idea of how to sentence the break-in defendants. Dash described to Sirica an approach called provisional sentencing, a new and controversial technique of imposing temporary sentences designed to coerce post-conviction cooperation with prosecutors. Judge Sirica liked the idea and used this technique, sentencing some Watergate defendants to prison terms well in excess of what might be expected, not only to gain cooperation with federal prosecutors, but to encourage cooperation with Sam Dash's own Senate investigation. Thus, Howard Hunt, with no prior criminal record, was sentenced temporarily to 35 years in prison for the first offense charge of abetting a burglary, a sentence that might be reduced if he cooperated with ongoing investigations. Now, provisional sentencing, which is no longer allowed, was bad enough, but never before, before or since, in any federal court of which I'm aware, have possible reductions in sentences been conditioned upon cooperation with political investigations to be conducted by congressional committees. What I have shown are four ex parte meetings with influential people each of whom had interests that were adverse to the Watergate defendants. It's almost as though if you had strong views of, about Watergate, you really should, you really owed it to yourself to drop by and see the judge. His door was always open. Let me now present several critical comments about Judge Sirica's trial conduct by one of the young lawyers who served on the House Judiciary Impeachment staff, Renata Adler. This material takes a little bit of time to go through, but since she lived through Watergate and she participated in the efforts to impeach Richard Nixon, she's a most knowledgeable and appropriate commentator to talk about someone else's actions during that era. I think you will also agree she wields a rather wicked pen. But you have to remember, when she wrote this, she had no idea of Judge Sirica's private meetings with the individuals that led to the actions that she finds so objectionable. Here is her commentary on Judge Sirica's efforts to get to the bottom of the Watergate break-in. A judge, after all, is not meant to be a hero, and judges under the Constitution are not meant to ascertain, least of all the prosecutor to coerce by sentencing the truth for the American people or even for the jury. They are to preside fairly under the adversary system over cases presented to them by lawyers for the plaintiffs and defendants before them. Anything else, whether it is posturing for the media or coercing defendants with outrageous provisional sentences, or working on behalf of some party not before the court, undermines the system. Far from demonstrating that no man is above the law, it suggests that the judge himself is above it. We do not, under the Constitution, have a system wherein judges are inquisitors. Next, while there were genuine doubts about whether an untainted jury could ever be seated within the District of Columbia, Judge Sirica was able to do so in just over a day's effort. And here, coming up in a moment, are Adler's comments on his actions in that regard. The questioning of jurors to be sure that they are unbiased and uh, untainted is called voir dire. And in federal courts, it's conducted by the judge, but always in the presence of counsel for both sides. In the matter of voir dire, Judge Sirica having promised to interview prospective jurors individually and in chambers, did not do so. And then she describes a juror who was talking to his wife on the phone uh, during the deliberations, and so that this is not, not allowable because of sequestration. It also turned out that the juror knew only Spanish and neither spoke nor understood English. To cover for this error, the juror couldn't understand the testimony about the burglary or the instructions in the law, Sirica dismissed the juror and simply, simply sealed this embarrassing portion of the record. The incident involved incompetence, surely, followed by a substantial lapse of integrity. 
Imagine if your liberty were at stake and you learned the judges' private interviews in selecting jurors had not even detected that one of them could neither speak nor understand English. Now Renata's comment on provisional sentencing. <clears throat> More serious was his use of provisional sentencing and outright dishonesty in at least one instance of it. Having imposed temporary sentences of unprecedented severity on the five defendants who pleaded guilty, Sirica told them that their actual sentences might depend on their cooperation with subsequent investigations. This was in itself a highly improper use of provisional sentencing, widely criticized as extortion, abuse of power, and the torture wreck. Far from demonstrating the bromide that no man, not even the president, is above the law, Judge Sirica proceeded as though one man, the judge himself, were above it. And finally, here's her comment on the unique treatment of Gordon Liddy. Gordon Liddy, you remember, refused to testify at all. The outright falsification was as follows, and she describes Judge Sirica quoting from an opinion, and he's changed the wording in his quote. The falsification was crucial. It enabled Judge Sirica to keep Liddy in jail in worse conditions and for a far longer term than any other Watergate defendant, including those far higher up in the administration, on the pretense that Liddy had not accepted the offer that Sirica had never made to him. The DC jail to which Sirica sent him was ancient, dirty, overcrowded, rat infested, with temperatures that reached 104 degrees. Liddy was, for a long time, the only white prisoner there. Jail is supposed to be a temporary holding facility for those awaiting trial or serving short terms of incarceration. Whatever you may think of Gordon Liddy's involvement, the idea that he was deliberately kept in the DC jail for almost five years is rather astounding. Now, all of these items that I have mentioned so far have had to do with Judge Sirica's conduct in the first Watergate trial, that of the burglars themselves. When the cover-up defendants, Nixon's senior aides, were indicted for conspiracy to obstruct justice on March 1st, 1974, and Judge Sirica appointed himself to preside over this second Watergate trial, they howled in protest. And they sought a writ of mandamus from the appellate court to remove him as their trial judge. I'm going to quote from the court's opinion in just a moment, but you need to know a little background to appreciate its content. First, that comprehensive cover-up indictment included naming President Nixon as an unindicted co-conspirator, as well as a grand jury report called the Roadmap that Judge Sirica forwarded to the House of Representatives. Each of these actions was highly significant and certainly unprecedented in American history. There were press reports at the time that the special prosecutor had met with the judge privately on more than one occasion to work out just how this sequence of events would be handled by the prosecutor's offices themselves and by the Watergate grand jury to which they were presenting their evidence. To defense counsel, the very idea that their trial judge had met privately with prosecutors on their case outside of their presence would be grounds for removal. Second, the judge had responded to a reporter's question about whether the defendants could ever expect a fair trial in the district after such a barrage of adverse publicity. And he had responded that there was no doubt in his mind, but that as fair a trial could be had in the district as anywhere else. To defense counsel, who would be asking Judge Sirica for a change of venue on the basis that a fair trial was impossible inside the district, this sounded as though his honor had already prejudged the issue. Prejudging such a key issue would be grounds for removal. Third, and finally, Judge Sirica's efforts to assist the prosecutors, among other things, his providing them with his own list of some nine individuals whom he demanded be brought before the grand jury for further questioning. This list was sealed, of course, but the defendants suspected they might have been on it, and one of them really was. To defense counsel, the idea of their trial judge already having accused at least one of them of being involved in the cover-up suggested that judge could not, pres could not pres preside fairly over their trial and would be grounds for removal. So as I mentioned, the defendants sought a writ of mandamus directing Judge Sirica to cease involvement in their case until further investigation of these events could occur. 
their appeal was taken to the circuit court, which promptly denied their request without a hearing, without issuing any opinion or rationale for their decision. The case was titled Mitchell v. Sirica, and I'm going to quote from the dissent by Judge McKinnon. There's no majority opinion to quote from. And Judge McKinnon in dissent cannot understand the majority's dismissal of an unsigned, in an unsigned one-sentence order without even granting a hearing. In conclusion, I dissent from the majority's summary disposition of this important en banc case without oral argument and without opinion. Moreover, I believe the petitioners have made a sufficient showing to require an evidentiary hearing concerning the number and nature of Judge Sirica's ex parte contacts with the prosecutors. At the very least, Judge Sirica should recuse himself from ruling on the defendant's motions for a change in venue, an issue on which he has conveyed the appearance of prejudgment. Finally, I would strongly suggest that Judge Sirica refer to a disinterested panel the question of whether the allegations of the affidavits charging judicial involvement in the prosecutorial process and prejudgment of material issues, which allegations cannot be contested, compels his disqualification. And then the judge notes, the special prosecutor and the American Civil Liberties Union concur in this latter suggestion. But no such actions were ever taken because the court's majority had simply denied the writ of mandamus. Imagine how you would feel if you were about to go to trial before Judge Sirica, especially after you have failed in your attempts to have him removed. But even more troublesome than this series of ex parte meetings and disturbing judicial conduct is Judge Sirica's own self-admitted attempt to influence the jury with his temporary sentencing of John Dean. Again, a little background. It's the usual practice in federal criminal courts to accept a plea from a government witness, but to postpone sentencing until after the trial in which his expected testimony will be heard. Thus, John Dean's sentencing had been postponed until after the Watergate cover-up trial, where he was to be the lead government witness. But the first case that came to trial didn't come to trial in Washington, DC. It came to trial in New York City. It involved an alleged illegal contribution to President Nixon's re-election campaign by Robert Vesco. And both defendants, Nixon's campaign manager and his top fundraiser, John Mitchell and Maurice Stans, had been acquitted. Juror interviews conducted after the trial suggested they simply did not find John Dean's testimony against Mitchell and Stans to be credible. Now, the entire cover-up case turned on, on John Dean's word against those of the defendants. Wanting to bolster Dean's credibility, Judge Sirica hastily convened a sentencing hearing and threw the book at John Dean. He sentenced him to a prison term of one to four years, with incarceration to begin on the first day the Watergate trial was scheduled to begin. Thus, completely contrary to the tradition of sentencing after trial, Judge Sirica's actions meant Dean could testify as the lead prosecution witness from prison and could say that he was already serving a very stiff sentence for his crimes, crimes which he claimed were done at the instruction of the Watergate defendants then on trial. No one ever thought Judge Sirica would actually admit that this was his intent to influence the jury. But here's how he describes his own motives in his own book. I knew what he, John Dean, said on the witness stand was not going to make any difference in the sentence I handed down. So to prevent the suggestion that he was testifying in the hope that I would reduce his sentence, I decided to give Dean that sentence well before the trial. Now, here's the view of that action by Richard Benvenisti. He's head of the Watergate task force that, that uh, investigated and prosecuted the cover-up. On just how key John Dean's sentence was, to his credibility as a witness in the cover-up trial. And this is uh, uh, Richard Benvenisti's book. Moral balancing aside, the real politic of the situation was that Dean would not be an effective witness at trial if he got a free ride. The evident effect of Dean's prison sentence later on the jurors at the Watergate cover-up trial confirmed our tactical judgment. As a man who was already serving a long jail term, 
Dean made a measurably greater impression than if he had never been charged or punished for his acts. Now, please note, there seems to be a little competition over just whose idea it was to hurry John Dean's sentencing. Since no motions were ever filed, if the idea did originate with a special prosecutor, this too was conveyed to Judge Sirica without notice to defendant's counsel or opportunity for them to object. Now, what's important to know is something that's not mentioned in his book, is that just one week after the convictions were obtained in the cover-up trial, Judge Sirica, on his own motion, reduced Dean's sentence to time served, making his four-month term, you see, he was only incarcerated during the trial itself, the shortest of any major Watergate figure. We can only imagine how credible Dean's testimony might have been if the jury had known that he would serve but four months for his actions in directing the cover-up. When your liberty is at stake, justice demands you have a judge who is above the fray. But I have presented a series of instances where Judge Sirica was really in the thick of it, in a series of private meetings with Edward Bennett Williams, with Clark Molinoff, with uh, Sam Dash, in a series of private meetings with prosecutors for both the break-in trial and the cover-up trial, and in, in attempting to increase John Dean's credibility with the jury with a temporary sentencing ploy. It's difficult to see how anyone can claim that Judge Sirica was fair or impartial. Let me conclude my discussion of this one part with this observation. It seems rather a straightforward issue that the judge who had appointed himself to preside over the Watergate break-in trial should never have been allowed to appoint himself to preside over the, over the subsequent cover-up trial. Why the appellate court didn't see it this way, we'll discuss in just a moment. But for now, let's talk about the jury pool. Due process certainly includes a fair trial before a jury of your peers, drawn from a pool that is both untainted and unbiased. But the DC jury pool was hopelessly tainted by the massively adverse pretrial publicity over the previous two years, including coverage of the break-in arrests, the subsequent conviction of the burglars, the riveting hearings of the Senate Watergate Committee, the deliberations of the House Judiciary Committee's impeachment proceedings against President Nixon, President Nixon's own resignation, followed a month later by President Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon. Remember, the cover-up trial began less than four weeks after President Ford's pardon. The nation, in short, was still reeling from the Watergate scandal when the cover-up trial began. How could you ever seat a jury within the district that was not already tainted? And it's not that people didn't see this coming. Archibald Cox, the first Watergate special prosecutor, when he was appointed, had attempted to shut off public hearings of the Senate Watergate Committee in order to avoid tainting the jury pool. That move was rejected by Judge Sirica. He's the one who called for those hearings. And he said, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Senator Irvin, who chaired the Senate Watergate Committee, when asked if publicity from his committee's gavel-to-gavel -gavel televised Watergate hearings might taint the jury pool, responded it was far more important for the American people to learn all they could about Watergate than to worry about convicting its perpetrators. All of these concerns evaporated, however, months later, after nonstop media coverage, including some 52,000 column inches of newsprint in DC newspapers, and of course a barrage of media coverage besides, when the cover-up trial began before Judge Sirica in the district. The convictions of the defendants was almost preordained. So with all that background in mind, let me read the opening paragraph from Judge McKinnon's dissent on the appeal of these convictions in the Watergate cover-up case. If ever, in the history of our country, there was a criminal case which by law had to be transferred to another place for trial because of the prejudicial pretrial publicity alone, this is that case. When this case was before us prior to trial, I stated the venue should have been changed to someplace other than the district. I adhere to that position. The trial court here denied a timely pretrial motion for change of venue, and in so doing, denied defendants one of their most basic constitutional rights, the right to a fair trial. 
Now, it's also possible that the D.C. jury pool was politically biased against the Watergate defendants. These were prominent Republicans, and they had been top leaders in the Nixon administration. Courts are understandably reluctant to get into this area, but here are some troublesome facts for you to consider. First of all, the District of Columbia is unlike any other political subdivision in America. It is the heaviest Democratic concentration in the nation, typically turning out Democratic majorities in presidential elections in excess of 85 percent. There's just no other place like it. Second, with regard to the Watergate trials, there's a very bright line. Convictions were obtained of every individual in every single trial held in the district with a single exception. And, correspondingly, every single trial held outside the district resulted in an acquittal. I submit that the single exception is the one that proves the rule. The acquitted defendant was Ken Parkinson, Creep's outside counsel who was retained after the break-in arrests. As John Dean wrote in his book, he was surprised at Parkinson's indictment in the first place because Dean knew of six others who were not indicted but who were far more deeply involved in the cover-up than Parkinson. Dean chalked it up to something he called mercy bait, a highly unethical prosecutorial trick of indicting a demonstrably less culpable individual so that his acquittal would be seen as validating the convictions of the other defendants. Now, the Watergate cases held outside the district involved equally prominent people. Uh, John Mitchell and Maurice Stans were acquitted in the Vesco trial in New York I mentioned earlier. Former Texas governor and uh, uh, Nixon Treasury Secretary John Connolly was acquitted of bribery in a trial in Texas in what's called the milk producer scandal that came to light during the Watergate investigations. And Archer Daniel Midland's CEO, Duane Andreas, was acquitted in his trial in Minnesota of misusing corporate funds for political donations that had come to light under Watergate. Third, more recent and highly controversial politicized trials in the district, including those of Lewis Scooter Libby, Vice President Dick Cheney's Chief of Staff, and of Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska, also have resulted in questionable convictions of prominent Republicans which has led more than one commentator to muse about whether any Republican can receive a fair trial in a political case inside the district. I think it's clear the D.C. jury pool was both tainted by the massive pretrial publicity and politically biased against the defendants, and their trial should have been moved to Baltimore, Maryland, or Richmond, Virginia, to solve these concerns. Let's move on to my third topic. Due process of law certainly includes a fair trial with a nonpartisan prosecutor bound by consistently applied rules of conduct. Yet, as the next slide shows, seven of the eight top officials in the special prosecutor's office all had worked together before. They'd worked together in Robert Kennedy's Department of Justice. They were top flight lawyers, to be sure, but they were also highly partisan Democrats. There's something inherently unsettling about the top lawyers from the previous administration being reassembled to prosecute top officials from the current administration. But the special prosecutors operated independently of the Department of Justice. They reported, if to anyone at all, to the Democratic majority on the Senate Judiciary Committee that had created their positions. In this regard, let's focus on their handling and treatment of John Dean the president's former lawyer, and his principal accuser. Here's what Archibald Cox, the original special prosecutor, thought about John Dean. Archie Cox was particularly, and this is the book by, ben, by Richard Benvenisti, the uh, uh, Watergate task force uh, head. Archie Cox was particularly firm in his personal determination that Dean be prosecuted no matter what. Dean became an idée fixe for Cox. With all the uncertainties of Watergate that surrounded him, that swirled around him, Cox saw Dean's guilt as the one enduring constant. During a particularly difficult period, Archer remarked to us, if everything else goes down the drain, the one thing I can cling to is Dean's venality. A quick summary of John Dean's role in Watergate may suggest why Archibald Cox held this view. John Dean triggered events in the Watergate break-in. 
Dean was the one assigned responsibility for developing the campaign intelligence plan. He's the one who recruited Gordon Liddy, promised him a huge budget, introduced him to John Mitchell, and presented him to Jeb Magruder as his choice for the job. Dean then hid his own risk of prosecution from his White House superiors. You see, Dean and Liddy and Magruder had attended those two key meetings I explained at the beginning in John Mitchell's office at the Department of Justice. That's where Gordon Liddy first presented his campaign intelligence plan costing a million dollars with proposals for mugging, bugging, kidnapping, and prostitution. Even today, however, there's no indication that senior White House aides knew of the plan break-in in advance. But what is clear is that shortly after the break-in burglars were arrested, President Nixon was informed that the trail, if followed carefully, could well lead to John Mitchell's doorstep. And President Nixon's reaction was swift and decisive. John Mitchell was removed as head of creep just two weeks following the Watergate break-in arrests. And he didn't meet with or speak with the president for almost a year thereafter. In short, President Nixon fired his best friend. Now, it's fair to assume that if John Dean uh, had, had told anyone at his risk of prosecution, he would have been forced out immediately because he, he was the one that worked with Gordon Liddy. He was at these two meetings. Instead, he, he didn't disclose this to his White House superiors, and he assured them that no one on the White House staff itself had any advanced knowledge of the break-in. And the White House proceeded to build its entire Watergate defense around Dean's assurance. Dean then acted as chief desk officer. These are his own words. Chief desk officer throughout the cover-up. While the White House was relying on him as their lawyer to protect their interests, he led the cover-up. Every day, all over America, lawyers defend criminal clients without they themselves breaking the law. And that's what I think people in the White House thought John Dean was doing. But instead of protecting the president, he cast his lot with the people at Creep who shared the risk of prosecution. In addition to obstruction of justice, the evidence suggested that Dean suborned perjury, improperly shared prosecutorial information with defense counsel, destroyed evidence, and embezzled campaign funds for his own personal use. It's not a pretty picture. Dean then switched sides and changed his story as the cover-up collapsed. Since he was running the cover-up, he realized early on when it began to unravel. When Jeb Magruder confided in John Dean his defeat and sought Dean's help in retaining criminal defense counsel, Dean launched his own race to meet with federal prosecutors and to offer to testify against his former colleagues in order to obtain personal immunity for his own criminal conduct. Changing political sides with ease, he retained as his lawyer a prominent Democrat from Robert Kennedy's Department of Justice. And they undertook a series of secret meetings with federal prosecutors while John Dean was still counsel to the president. There's little question but that John Dean's story about Watergate changed during this key period. Escalated is the word one of the prosecutors used. The real question is why, were this inf why was this information about changes in Dean's story never shared with counsel for defendants? Let's take a quick look at what seems to have happened. As you can see from this slide, there are 10 meetings between John Dean and his lawyer with the federal prosecutors over the critical 30-day period as the cover-up collapsed. What happened was the federal prosecutors were replaced by the, by the special prosecutors, and they interviewed the previous people about what John Dean said when he came in during these critical meetings. And here are the handwritten notes quotes from the handwritten notes of those interviews. On April 6th, nothing about Ehrlichman, Haldeman, or the president. Schaffer, that's John Dean's lawyer, talked only of Mitchell and Magruder. And on April 8th, no information from Dean, this is in a meeting with Dean, no information from Dean about Ehrlichman or Haldeman. And on April 9th, Dean didn't mention cover-up until later. I mean, the idea that there was a cover-up going on didn't come up until after these meetings. And again, on the 9th, they start talking about money going to the defendants. This is what was called hush money. 
But Dean never said the money was for Hunt's silence. And finally, on May 2nd and 3rd, this is the end of the 10 meetings, a month after John Dean first approached the prosecutors, Dean becomes antagonistic to Ehrlichman and Haldeman, whereas before he had given the impression that Haldeman was clean and was restrained as to Ehrlichman's involvement. Just think how dearly defense counsel would have liked to have had these notes, these handwritten notes, which they could have used to impeach Dean's credibility as the lead government witness in the cover-up trial. Now, the handwritten notes were then typed up. So there's a memo, a typewritten memo, that seeks to summarize these handwritten notes. And what I'm going to show you next is the same entry at the bottom, uh, uh, May 2nd and 3rd. Before that, the impression he gave of Haldeman was of a great devoted public servant, clean and hardworking. He had been restrained in his praise of Ehrlichman. Now, I think you can see at least one prosecutor who's typing this up was worried about having to turn this information over to defense and was already reinterpreting what had actually been said in the interviews by changing the clear intent of the statements recorded in the handwritten notes. It didn't say that Haldeman was a hardworking public servant. He said he was clean. He didn't say he was restrained in praise of John Ehrlichman. He said, his, he said the involvement of John Ehrlichman was restrained. I think you can see how important, oh, and then I have one other. This is the, uh, the quote on the area when Dean first starts to talk about President Nixon. On May 3rd, this is the last of the 10 meetings, a month after he's met with prosecutors, Dean began focusing on presidential involvement, thus dramatically changing his previous stance. I think you can see how important this information might have been and how devastating its use could have been at trial, which is perhaps why it was never turned over to defense counsel. That was required, specifically required under the Jenks Act. The act says federal prosecutors have to provide defense counsel with any and all potentially exculpatory information. We're going to summarize this section because we have one more. I would suggest the evidence shows the special prosecutors were highly partisan Democrats and so eager to secure convictions against their political opponents that they hid exculpatory evidence from defense counsel. Our final focus has to do with the appeal. A due process certainly includes a fair trial with the right to an appeal to a court of review that is itself both fair and impartial. Whatever the mistakes or injustices that may have occurred in the conduct of the trial below, this can be raised for review and full hearing on appeal, typically before a panel of three circuit court judges. The difficulty for the defendants was that the D.C. Circuit Court itself was hugely politicized and still dominated by a liberal block of appointees from prior Democratic administrations. To appreciate what seems to have happened, it's helpful to understand a little of the history that surrounded that particular court. Prior to Nixon's election in 1968, the D.C. Circuit Court heard more appeals from criminal cases than all other federal circuit courts combined. And there's a very simple reason for this. Most criminal prosecutions were brought under state laws so appeals would go through the state appellate system. But the District of Columbia didn't have an independent appellate system, so appeals from any and all criminal convictions went through the D.C. Circuit. Because of judicial appointments under prior administrations, there was a liberal block of five judges on that court who rather consistently discovered new rights for criminal defendants. That's one reason why Judge Sirica was so uh, overruled with such frequency. Any appeals from this growing list of aggressive interpretations by the D.C. Circuit Court was, it was heard on appeal in turn to the Supreme Court presided over by Chief Justice Earl Warren. In essence, the D.C. Circuit Court was a primary feeder court to the Warren Supreme Court, against which Richard Nixon had regaled in his successful 1968 campaign for the presidency. Indeed, among his very first acts as president was to propose to create an independent appellate court system within the district. And that was enacted in October of 1969. It was the first piece of legislation to go through. And it took the D.C. court out of the criminal appellate process. It was a slight they did not take lightly. As you can see from this next slide, 
it was a 5-4 split. Now, we showed Judge Tam uh, there as the uh, fourth name, but he was, an, he was an appointee of Johnson, but he was a Southern Democrat and former deputy director of the FBI. So we, we can't call him uh, a liberal. But this political divide, this 5-4 split, was particularly well known to government lawyers who practiced before that court with some regularity, and that certainly included the top prosecutors of the special prosecutor's office. Still, if you think about it, any randomly selected three-judge panel still has a chance of getting more than one conservative who might be more worried about the need for due process in the trials below, particularly ones before Judge Sirica. The challenge you see for special prosecutors was how to preserve the liberal dominance in any given appeal, particularly the ones from Judge Sirica. Watergate special prosecutor Archibald Cox who had been Solicitor General under Robert Kennedy and knew this court quite well, took it upon himself to meet privately with the D.C. Circuit Court's chief judge, David Bazelon, to urge upon him a unique approach, that his court hear these appeals before nine full judges called an en banc hearing in legal parlance, and to do so in the first instance, rather than as a traditional rehearing. The unique procedure from the first instance is called sua sponte. We're going to teach you a lot of Latin here today. And the combined approach is called sua sponte en banc, all nine judges from the very outset. That would guarantee the court's liberal block would dominate in any and all appeals from Judge Sirica's rulings. It would also be completely unprecedented. Here's how this story was relayed to me. Imagine the much vaunted Archibald Cox of the Harvard Law School making an ex parte approach to the chief judge of the very appellate court that would hear appeals from cases he had brought. Well, let's take a look at what happened. Here's a list of the 13 appeals taken from Judge Sirica's rulings in both the break-in trial and the cover-up trial. And of course, if you review them, each and every one was heard sua sponte en banc. And all but one, Mar uh, Robert Martin's appeal, the second the last, upheld Judge Sirica, always with the uniform support of the court's liberal bloc. Seven of these opinions were per curiam. They were not even signed. And one that we talked about previously, Mitchell v. Sirica, didn't even get the benefit of a hearing. The Mardian reversal is rather easily explained. His lawyer had fallen ill about a week before the trial, and he wanted to be postponed, and Judge Sirica wouldn't let him. He demanded he be included in the cover-up trial. This was too much even for the appellate court who reversed and remanded for a new trial for Robert Mardian. But Mardian was such a minor player in the overall picture, no further prosecution occurred and he went free. The true targets all along and the only ones ultimately convicted in the Watergate cover-up trial were President Nixon's top three aides, John Mitchell, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, everyone else was small beer. The simple fact is that never before or since in any appellate court in the history of our judiciary has this phenomenon of sua sponte en banc occurred, except in highly rare isolated instances, and certainly never in a string of 13 cases. It gives me no pleasure to stand before you this afternoon and suggest the fix was in in the D.C. Circuit Court, but such appears to be the case. The situation calls out for review and remediation, even today, but it does seem to explain why the defendants got nothing even close to a fair trial. Well, I hope I've raised a lot of questions for you this afternoon about due process and how important it is to assure there's a fair trial, even in times of intense political turmoil. Some 40 years later, I think these issues are still relevant, and to me, the evidence suggests the complete absence of these constitutionally guaranteed rights. Judge Sirica was neither fair nor impartial. The D.C. jury pool was both tainted and biased. The special prosecutor was politically motivated and hid exculpatory evidence from defense, and the appellate review was neither fair nor impartial. Let me conclude with one troubling thought. If one or more of these top aides had actually been acquitted, questions might well have lingered about just what really had happened in Watergate and whether what the American people had been told about the, about the origins and responsibilities for the Watergate scandal was an accurate portrayal of what really had happened. Instead of the bland assurances that, everyone, that everything had worked as the Constitution intended, we might have been allowed to wonder whether we had lost a presidency for just cause. Thank you for being with me for this afternoon.
I'm happy to take questions, but let me ask that you limit questions, if you have any, to what I've discussed today. Thank you again. I just have a question about the inaccuracy of our Watergate exhibit. I read the lengthy rebuttal to that. Is there any chance of correcting any of the inaccuracies now that we have a different administrator? That's the reason. That's the reason I ask that we limit our questions to the due process discussion that I put up. They, and I understand your concern. We've talked about it before. I share your concern. The due process arguments are not addressed in, in, in the least in the exhibit, but I'm not responsible for the exhibit or for challenges to the exhibit. I, I uh, demur, another legal term. Other questions from anyone? Let me, let me get the microphone to you. Well, I have a question uh, regarding race. Um, in the 50s and 60s, when a, a black guy in the South was convicted by an all-white jury, the liberals always raised holy hell. Yet, yes. um, I understand that in, um, there's another Watergate-related conviction of, um, of Ed Reinecke. He was convicted of, uh, his jury consisted of all blacks and all Democrats. And yes. according to Victor Lasky, the grand jury that Call Nixon an unindicted co-conspirator was also all black. Yeah, it, it's a sensitive subject, uh, and I'm winging this. So the, the issue in the South was there were plenty of blacks who could serve on the juries, and they were, they were uh, system systematically uh, prevented from serving on the jury. The difficulty in the District of Columbia is that they're all Democrats, and, and a vast majority happen to be black. So it's not a, a, it's not a systemic uh, uh, kicking off of white jurors, but it's a huge problem. Now, I, I, I limited my comments today to, to, to political outlook, but there's, there's no question that the Nixon administration was not popular uh, within the vast majority of people within the District of Columbia, and it's, it's the pool. I, I don't happen to know who served on the actual juries, and I don't happen to care. It's whether the pool itself was tainted, and I'm very careful to limit my argument to that. Another question? Well, we'll conclude our session today. Thank you again for, thank you again for coming. Oh, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. Raised my hand a little late there. Well, there's a light between you and me. Uh, I'm curious as to your comment regarding the symposium that took place at Chapman College last week and whether your presentation today would have been the one that you would have uh, presented last week at the college. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that the uh, triggering event for this presentation was my being invited by the students at Chapman to participate in their symposium. As you know, I was removed uh, from, uh, from being allowed to give my presentation. Yes. Uh, but I got excited and I added to it. I can't tell you this is, this is very close to what I would have presented. This is what I wanted to present, but it didn't work out. Well, we're, we're sorry that that happened because I think Chapman University's students would have benefited very much. And uh, we thank students, you very much for being here today. The students themselves wanted to hear from me. Thank you again for coming. Bye-bye now. <laughs>